All right, welcome to the webinar today. We're gonna to be talking about, do you wanna be a mom and pop apartment investor? And so we're gonna go, be going through and diving through these topics today about what is a mom and pop operator, pros and cons of acquiring smaller properties, what are typical returns for mom and pop style assets? And is it better to passively invest in large syndications? And we'll sprinkle in a few more things as we go throughout as well, as usual. For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm this gentleman down here at the bottom. I'm also here on your screen. Good to see you. Um, I'm the founder of the Multifamily Investor Nation, and I'm also the managing partner of a group called PassiveInvesting.com. So you can go to PassiveInvesting.com. And for those of you who are joining us live, um, I'm going to type here, so I pressed the wrong button there. I'm going to type here into the chat box so you can actually go to the website and find out more information. And uh, you can click on this meet the team link right up here at the top. And then you can see our team here. And then you can also click on uh, my name here, Dan Hanford, and find out more information about me. I won't go into a lot of detail here, but I am married. I live in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, I'm here with my four children, my wife, and, our, and we have three girls and a boy. And we also have a, a dog as well, a, a, a standard poodle named Bella. Um, so you can go to this website if you want to find out more information. You can obviously go to our website to join our Passive Investor Club if you want to join us on some of our future opportunities. You can click on this little button at the top or fill in the form on the right, depending on which kind of page you are on. Well, we are only accepting accredited investors at this time. So if you don't know what an accredited investor is, you can go there and click on this. Uh, it's nothing really you have to do very specially, uh, depending on the offering, but um, we can dive into more details about that uh, if you decide to choose to, to join us. But we have a, an offering right now that you can click on. It's called Current Offering, and it'll bring you to this page here, which is the Braxton Carey Weston Project out of Raleigh, North Carolina. So if you're looking at an, an opportunity and you have some capital you want to invest, obviously we'd love to have the opportunity to be able to have you invest in this project. It's a $57.6 million acquisition. It's a five-year hold. And uh, here's are some of the return metrics we have. We have due to two different classes of shares. We have a cl class A and a class B. And if you want to look at the end of the actual offering memorandum for the investors a little bit closer, you can fill out your, your full name, email, and phone number there in this form. And, uh, and we'll send that to you right away so you can take a look at this particular offering a little bit closer. And the last thing I wanted to mention to you, because some of you had asked me about this on the last uh, webinar that we did, is I talked about this pick fund. It's called the Pack of Passive Investor Club, Pick Fund One. Um, it actually is a short-term, uh, it's a short-term private lending fund that we're using and Rehab Wallet is going to, is actually the borrower facing front of the fund. And if you would like, I'll tell you a little bit about this. So just briefly, um, I can send this investment summary to you. If you, if you want more information about this, uh, just shoot me over an email, dan at passiveinvesting.com. I can shoot you more details about this fund and how it works, but it has a 6% preferred return no upside potential, a minimum investment is 25,000. It does have monthly compounding available. So you actually can get a little bit more than 6% uh, return if you compound it monthly. Um, but it does also offer a 90 day liquidity. So with our multifamily offerings, you're locking your funds up for five to seven years. With this particular offering, this particular fund, you're only locking your money up for uh, however long you want. And then you can you have a 90 day liquidity. So if you wanted the money out, um, it can usually we can get it out sooner than 90 days, but it's up to 90 day liquidity option, meaning that you can have it in there for six months, a year, five years, whenever you need the money, you can say, hey, I need that money back out or just a portion of it. And we have up to 90 days to, to give you that money back or, or we can do it sooner than that, just depending on uh, how many investors are coming in and coming out and the loans that are coming due around that same time. But I can send you more information about this, but this particular offering is really for those who uh, just want to be able to put their, their money uh, to work. And we're actually providing short-term private loans to fix and flippers, rehabbers, primarily here in the Carolinas, but also some in Georgia, Florida, Tennessee, that those, these areas for right now. And so if you want to join us on that, just shoot me an email, dan at passiveinvesting.com. I'll send you this, this document here so you can review it further. And then uh, we can have a further conversation about it. All right. That's enough about me and our group and some of the offerings that we have right now. Let me tell you a little bit about these mom and pop um, apartments. So first off, I want to back up and kind of tell you a little bit of a story about how I got started in multifamily because it'll help you have a better understanding as to my opinion on the mom and pop apartments. So when I first got into multifamily, I got into it because I was I was I had a business that was producing really nice cash flows for me, and I was having to pay a lot of money in taxes to the government, and I was trying to find a way to be able to offset my taxes. I mean, to offset my 
um, taxes so that I could reduce my taxable liability, right? And so one of the first things I did naturally is I started reading a lot of books and started going, going, listening to some podcasts and YouTube videos and, you know, started to look at my own market for these smaller mom and pop apartments. And so I started realizing that there was, a, there was some opportunity here, right? And so I started to look at um, what these mom and pop operators were doing. And so for those of you who are, are, don't really know what I mean when I say mom and pop operator, this is a non-institutional owner that is typically going to be anywhere between about three to five millions, maybe even less than that. So I'd probably say one to five million, somewhere around in there. And it, the reason why they're called mom and pop is because it's usually like a mom and a dad or a, a husband and a wife that go and actually acquire this property. And they'll either usually live on the property or maybe they'll be a local in the market. Maybe they'll have a kind of grow their portfolio and they'll have multiple properties. Um, but a lot of times they're operators that are operators because they thought it would be great to be able to invest in real estate. And so they bought an apartment. They didn't really know what they were doing, um, but they, they did it earlier on and earlier on. And now it's appreciated and there's a lot of upside maybe there's a lot of deferred maintenance or maybe there's some extra work that you have to do from a renovation standpoint. So it can be a really good buy for somebody if you want to put a lot of that work into it. And so that's kind of what that mom and pop operator is, is a smaller operator. They're typically not as sophisticated as you might see. And when you, once you start to get into the, the larger space, which right now our group passiveinvesting.com is only acquiring properties in the large apartment space, right? So they're only going inside of the, we're only going inside of the 20 million to $75 million range. I just had somebody ask me on here about the pick fund and I can actually send you this document. I didn't even think about doing that, this link. I'll send you this link here. Uh, so you don't have to email me for it. You can just click on that. And if you want more information, obviously you can you know, email me and I can jump on a call with you. But going back to my story here. So when I first started in the multifamily, that's one of the things that I did is I looked for these mom and pop operators. I mean, I, I remember driving around town, driving for dollars, if you will. And I know that's usually used for somebody who's maybe in a wholesaling space or whatever, but I, or fix and flips or, you know, things like that. But I was driving around town looking for these mom and pop operators. I kind of knew because some of the properties that were around and who, who were those smaller mom and pops. And so I started to reach out to them and stuff and found a couple of properties that I wanted to get. And I remember putting offers on different properties. And I think that the, the first property that I put an offer on was a, a, like a $1.7 million property that I put an offer on. And it was a smaller mom and pop operator. It was a, I think it was maybe like, you know, 12 units or maybe something like that, 12 to 15 units, somewhere around in there, maybe, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more than that. And I thought, man, this is gonna be great. I'm gonna own this property. And of course, management, I didn't have really, there was not, when, once you start to get below about 50 units, 50 to 75 units, it was a lot harder to find good, solid property management companies to be able to handle that because they're not on site. They're usually off site. And so it's a little bit harder to be able to maintain an asset like that. So that's, again, one of the, the cons of investing in some of these smaller properties is that property management can sometimes be very challenging to be able to, to be able to do it. And so I started to look into this and started to run the numbers. And I'm like, the returns are really, they're, 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 they could be really good if you can, can renovate the property and, and increase the rents and be able to, you know, maintain it like that. But they can take a lot more of your time away from you because you're having to spend a lot more time on these smaller assets where, where my kind of the dichotomous decision was is should I do I go after these smaller mom and pop properties where I uh, it's going to take more of my time it's going to take more of my efforts to be able to find the properties and then eventually I got to sell them so it's going to take more of my time to sell them and of course you got taxes at the end of the year that you have to process and you know what if, what if you have to make decisions about evicting ten tenants or residents or whatever and it's going to be a lot more issues there, especially for maintenance and stuff. And the returns were, you know, probably in that uh, 13, 14% upwards to 20% range, right? Um, typically where you might see some of these, uh, these, these, uh, these, these smaller mom and pop returns is what you're going to be in. And sometimes you can be more, it just depends on how aggressive you are with your underwriting and your projections and things like that. Um, but then I started to, on the other side of that decision tree, it was, was what, what about just passively investing inside of some of these large multifamily syndications and, and what could I do to just, pa what kind of returns could I get if I just passively invested? And what I found is that I could either spend a, extra, a lot of my time investing in these assets and acquiring them myself in the smaller mom and pop arena, 
or I could jump over here and actually invest passively inside of a large syndication group. And that's what I did first. So my first couple of deals that I did, I actually invested passively first. So I would highly encourage any of you who are listening, if you haven't taken the plunge yet and invested passively inside of these uh, larger syndications that you should consider it. It's a very good thing to do. Um, I, I have been very pleased with my portfolio right now. I'm uh, just over 30 multifamily investments with, the, with, with the nine different operators across the country. And, uh, and so it's, it started out with just one, right? I started out with one and over a couple of years, we were able to build my portfolio up where I had multiple investments across multiple operators and uh, multiple markets. And, uh, and my returns in that particular segment of it are greater than what I was seeing over in the, if I was to have to do the property myself. So I looked at it and said, time versus you know, kind of a cost benefit analysis or a time benefit analysis, which one's gonna take more of my time. Now, obviously if you go full cycle, you see now I'm putting together our own projects with their larger projects. And we have a team that we've built out to be able to do it as well, right? And so we have now built on top of my own passive investments, our, our group, PassiveInvesting.com, where we're acquiring these properties ourselves and putting them together. And, you know, this year we're going to be cresting over that, um, that, that $400 million mark of, of, of properties that we're going to be acquiring and, uh, or 350 million, excuse me, we're crushing over that $350 million mark. And so it's going to be exciting to kind of see how, uh, uh, more and more of these properties come to fruition and go full cycle and, and what kind of the returns are. So to see a full picture of some of these to, to compare it to whether you would go full picture, full, full cycle with a mom and pop. But again, this, there's the, the extra time that you're going to have involved inside of the, the smaller mom and pop style ones as well. So uh, what are some of the additional pros and cons of acquiring smaller properties? So one of the pros of, of, of acquiring smaller properties, some of the, like the, the benefits is that you could have the potential for higher returns, right? So because it is an asset that you are the only investor on, it is potential that you could have higher returns with those, uh, with those smaller properties. But anything that has higher return is typically higher risk, right? Especially for somebody who doesn't have a lot of experience being able to manage these types of assets, then it's going to be a lot more of a learning curve for you to be able to, you know, get your own cuts and bruises and kind of, you know, learn that that, that learning curve is going to be pretty high for you. Right. And, uh, and so what you have to realize is that uh, whenever you're, going after these properties. So you, you have the potential for higher returns if you do them all yourself, but you also are spending a lot of your own time and energy and effort to be able to acquire these instead of truly being just a passive investor. And some of you might be thinking, well, yeah, well, I'll just hire a property management company. Well, that's great, but the property management company always has to talk to you about what to do next on various things. Like if they want to kick out a resident, obviously they're going to probably call you and say, hey, this person hasn't paid in one month, two months, you know, what should we do? Okay, you know, I kick them out. Great, all right, kick them out. And then the, if you have to, uh, if there's anything maintenance wise on the property, that's like you know, heavy CapEx stuff, they're going to have to call you and ask you about those things. And then when it gets to the point of, you know, uh, paying some of those bills, you're going to probably have to be in there and having somebody manage you that managing that and having that, you're going to have to have a CPA. So there's definitely some additional headaches that come that come, in, come into play when you're talking about taking down these properties. But again, one of the things I had a phone call this morning with one of our passive investors and he was asking me, he said, uh, you know, what, what's, what's the, um, uh, he, he was at, I just lost my train of thought here. What is the reason why you are, um, uh, why, 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 why we go after these, these higher end assets, these B plus and A class assets versus going across and trying to buy some of these lower end C class properties. And it's the same answer that I would give you with these, this mom and pop syndicator is question too, is when you're comparing investments, the, when you're comparing investments, you're talking about uh, different risk profiles, right? So the higher the risk, the higher the return the lower the risk, the lower the return. That's typically how it works. So obviously you could buy some lower risk mom and pops. If you bought a, you know, like a brand new, new development and smaller mom and prop, you know, by 10, 15, 20 units, you're going to still have, it'll still be a lower risk, but again, you're going to have lower return there too. But whenever you involve somebody who doesn't have as much experience managing the assets, AKA maybe yourself, and you're trying to acquire these properties, whether it's a new property or an older property, there's going to be an inherent level of extra risk involved because of inexperience, right? 
And I'm not trying to sit here and discourage you from investing inside of a mom and pop operation because if that's what you want to do, that's great. Go do it, right? If you have that extra time, you want to do it, go buy those properties. There's a lot of returns that can be made off of those. It's just, I'm just trying to tell you that from a passive investor's perspective, it's not going to be very passive, right? Um, it's going to be, it's going to take a lot more of your, 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 your time and energy and effort to be able to take down those properties. And you're also going to have to sign on the, sign on the loans too. So you're going to be putting up your own net worth and liquidity and all that kind of stuff. And so it's going to be a lot, a lot more work and time and energy and effort for you as the investor. It's not going to be very passive. Whereas if you look at some of these larger multifamily syndications, you're going to have a lot more opportunities to be able to invest passively and be a true passive investor. You don't have to sign on the debt. You don't have to find the deals. You don't have to, you know, really do anything other than review the documents, wire the funds, and then you start to get rid of your returns. And we, on our group, we always do it with, uh, uh, a monthly distribution. So we have a deal actually that's closing later this week and it's actually closing on Friday and those distributions will start in December and they'll start monthly ongoing after that. And so we start those distributions as fast as we can for our investors. And that also means we have to find a certain level of assets. So we're not going to be going and finding an asset that's underperforming and, you know, low occupancy and think that we can perform it better. We're going to be only buy properties that are stabilized, which means they have to have at least 90% or above occupancy. And the lowest occupancy property we've bought is a 93% occupancy property. And so because we need those cash flows to be able to give back to our, our investors when we have distributions. And so we have to be able to, you know, find a certain quality of investor and a certain type of investor as well. All right. So uh, let's see here. So there's there definitely the potential for the higher returns for the smaller mom and pops. It's going to take a little more of your time. And uh, one of the additional challenges is, like I said earlier, is going to be the property management company. I know a lot of people who have started out that with, with acquiring these smaller mom and pop operations and they threw their arms up in the air and decided to hire, started to start their own property management company because they were frustrated because it's very hard to find a good solid property management company in that smaller multifamily space. And so they start their own property management company, become vertically, vertically integrated. And now you're managing a whole nother level of business because now you got to hire, you know, people who are managing it. You got to have maintenance people and, you know, accounting people and the whole staff just be able to manage your asset. And that could be, it could be quite time consuming, but again, it could be quite fun depending on where you are in your stage in life. Um, so let me go ahead. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead and open it up for any questions that you might have. So go ahead and uh, type into the chat box, any questions that you might have. And then, uh, you know, we can also use the Q and a box if you want, if you will there as well. Uh, Kevin had a question here about, is this only for passive investing? So, uh, well, I mean, the, as far as the multifamily side of things, as far as the the larger properties, that's what I'm talking about is more passive investing, right? But when you're talking about, you know, asking your, if you're asking yourself the question, do you want to be a mom and pop apartment investor? That's really asking yourself, do you want to be the only one acquiring that asset? Or even if you wanted to JV that, that asset, are you the only one that want to do that? Because it's not going to be truly passive, right? You're going to have to be able to make some decisions that are, ha are going to have to happen on that property. You're going to have to, if you're going to be getting debt, you're going to have, which I would, you know, encourage most of you on here, if you're getting, you're going to be acquiring a large property to be able to put the debt on the property, uh, at least smart debt on the property, not over leveraged debt. Um, you're going to have to, you know, sign on as a loan guarantor on, on the on the loans, and so there's a lot more things that you're going to have to do. So you're not going to be truly passive. So uh, you definitely want to make sure that you are, you know, trying to be in that space as much as you can. Uh, Sean, uh, Shan, thanks you for thank you for your comments there. I appreciate that. Let's see, tax filing status of active versus passive. It often makes a big difference. Yes, Robert, you are correct. You are absolutely correct there. So. If you are, uh, if you are investing from, uh, if you are, and again, I'm going to talk about taxes here, but I'm not a tax advisor or a tax attorney or anything like that. It's just from an educational perspective. Um, but the question here was a really, not really a question, but the statement here was about the tax filing status between being an active investor versus a passive investor. And yes, you do get more benefits being an active investor versus being a passive investor. And so it really just depends on where you are in your stage of life, right? And that's why it's great to have some good tax people and consultants on your side to say, where, where should I be? Should I be in the active side? Should I be on the passive side? Does it really matter for my tax situation? And so in my situation, the reason why it was really beneficial for me to be on the active side is that I can now, because I'm classified as a real estate professional, I can offset 
my all my income by the depreciation off the assets, which is really beneficial for me from the from a tax perspective. Whereas if you're a passive investor only, you could only um, offset your 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 passive income with passive depreciation, and so it does. There is a big difference there when it comes to the tax filing staff for status. So good 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 point there, uh, Robert. All right, next question here is: What's your take on investing passively? on a smaller scale, like a one underperforming asset, I, I go, like a underperforming asset in the mid 100 units. So the, the, from, a, from a passive perspective, I, I, don't, I would not put my money inside of that at, at this point. So, and the reason why is because I've seen firsthand how those small, those mid-sized properties are a challenge to manage because they're a challenge to manage from a, uh, from a boots on the ground standpoint, the only way that I would probably consider investing passively is if that group was was vertically integrated, meaning that they had their own property management company, their own, their own management site, management, management team, not necessarily on site, but but near the site, right? So they had that presence in that local market. And so I guess it wouldn't be a complete no for, for across the board, but if, uh, if they were not able to do that. Now, I have seen some properties that are higher end properties. I invested in one recently. I think it had like 80 units in it. And it was a kind of a high rise building that I built that I, that I didn't build, but I, I invested in. And I was fine to be able to invest in that one because even though it was under hundred units, they had on site property management. And it's because of the quality of those, those, of those, uh, those, those houses or those, those, those apartments that were on that on site. Dan, you said you are having invested about nine multifamily city goes, who are they and which ones have you had the best experience with and why? <laughs> so, I'm not going to mention all their names on here just because uh, there are some that I, uh, I, I don't want to uh, talk about because of, uh, uh, I have to tell you what, if you want to have that conversation, I'm more than happy to do it, but I'm not going to do it in a public forum like this. So um, I'll discuss that uh, privately one-on-one -on -one with you if you'd like, it's not a problem. All right. So uh, next question that coming in here is, is have you done a presentation on what to do in performing due diligence on a sponsor? If not, can you please present something in the future? That's actually a great, a great topic. I have done one of those, I believe in the past. Um, we did a series on red flags. So let me see if, uh, actually, let me just do this real quick. Um, I'm going to go to our YouTube channel real quick and see if I can find that because inside of the YouTube channel, there is, uh, something on this red flags. Um, I thought I did one. There it is. So here is one right here. And I'm going to type this into the chat box here. For those of you who are on here, you want to watch this. This is actually called the, uh, the red flags. Let me actually here it is. It's called the red flags for passive investing in apartments. And we talked a lot about uh, some of the things when it, that has to do with vetting operators and things like that. So make sure that, uh, um, that you go watch that because it'd be a very important for you to be able to kind of take, but I can do it. I, I can make a note of that and uh, maybe do another one about due diligence on sponsors so that you can have a little bit more uh, insights on that one. So I'll have uh, Melissa also make a, doc, make a note of that because I know she's on here and she can make a note of that topic because we're going to sit down next week and write out the next, uh, you know, three or four months worth of content that's going to be happening as well. So you can certainly do that. All right. Next question coming in here is... Uh, how do you know when it's underperforming? Well, when you, when, whenever you're interested in a particular asset and you're driving around, Properties that you can see that have a lot of deferred maintenance, you know, they have grass that's growing up really high or their, their sign is falling down or just old and, and kind of faded or the, that's the buildings themselves that is looking, looking disrepair. Those are going to be some of your small and smaller mom and pop operators that are likely just burned out and just ready to, ready to move on. Okay. And, uh, and so to know if they are truly underperforming, I mean, you, if there's a lot of deferred maintenance, it probably is because they're not gonna be able to command the rents that they need to kind of keep the occupancy up if they're not taking care of their, their, their asset. And so that's one way to know. But then obviously, whenever you get a hold of that seller and you're gonna be getting their financials, you can see, because you're gonna look at their financials to see if it is actually underperforming or not. 
Uh, let's see. Similarly, due diligence on a prospective property management company. Yes, um, I actually did a webinar on that as well. Um, it's been a while. Let me see if I can pull this one out of my hat here in a minute. Um, property management, ten, top 10 questions to, to ask uh, when hiring a property management company. So let me share this with you as well. Um, let me see if I can get that thing going. Yeah, it was back when I did PowerPoint. So, <laughs> um, oh, yeah, okay, there it is. Um, Eugene, yes, and if you just if you just joined us, we will be sending out a link to this for the for the for the uh, recording. So make sure you uh, check your email uh, probably later this afternoon or tomorrow, and we'll get that out to you. Let's see. Uh, Mike is asking, I'm looking for a property between 1 million to 1 and a half million in the Portland market, having trouble finding a return above 10% IRR without significant upgrades. Do these properties typically produce lower returns without, um, you know, the returns 12% plus earlier. So typically what you're going to see, Mike, is if you do no renovations at all, your um, overall returns are going to be lower than the, are going to be lower than 10%. And when I, when I mentioned, you know, a returns of 12% plus on some of these properties that we're looking at, they are property. That's, that's what the return's going to be once you go, once you actually do a full cycle on the deal. So if you actually go full cycle on the deal and you sell it, the cash on cash on these are going to usually be between about seven to about 9% is what you're going to, what we're going to usually see as far as the, the average cash on cash during the hold period. So but when you go full cycle with the deal, that's really where when you're going to produce that nice pop on the back end when you sell the asset. And so uh, if, you're, if you're trying to buy a property and not doing any upgrades, then it's going to be a little bit more challenging for you to find one that's going to have to produce those kind of returns unless you're in a high rent growth market. And then you might be able to find something like that. Let's see. Um, what do you look for? Okay, so... Uh, uh, Brett was asking, uh, let me rephrase the question. What do you look for in a syndicator before investing with them? And so I will point you back to that video of the red flags with apartment investors, because that actually is uh, where I go through what I look for when I'm investing with a, with a, with a, with a, uh, a pat, I'm looking to invest passively. Those red flags are things that I look for when I am investing. And they, they are true red flags. I mean, if they exist, I don't invest. So make sure you take a look at that and that'll give you some good insights on that as well. Let's see. A, a lot of investors are waiting until after the election to invest. Are you following or do you recommend that strategy also? So I would say it depends on your situation and how much you have to invest, right? So there are, there are some people, some investors that are, that are sitting, on their, sitting on the sidelines, not investing, but I will tell you in the latter half of this year, actually within the last uh, probably 120 days of this year, we actually have, let me see, let me just do some calculations here. Uh, we have just over 44 million of money of of money of capital that we have raised to be able to put inside of our deals, right? Or that we will raise. So we have another deal we're going to be releasing next week, and uh, and so that's going to add some additional money on top of what our current two deals are. Um, but we're going to be raising a little over 44 million. So I know there are some investors. There's probably more few investors more than there is a majority of investors. Uh, the majority of investors are still investing because they realize even depend, even on the outcome of the election, you know, in multifamily is still the place to be right now. And there hasn't been much price, price mobility uh, upwards or downwards uh, when it comes to the market right now. So uh, even with COVID-19. So uh, I, I would suggest with doing what I'm doing, which is I'm investing, right? I mean, I'm investing money right now. I need the depreciation benefit. Uh, I want to invest because I, I like to be able to see those cash flows. I can take those cash flows and reinvest them and continue to snowball my investments over time. Let's see. If situation permits, one could invest in both, some passive and some small multifamily. Won't this work for some? Yes, Jerry, it could. It could definitely work for some. And I'm not advocating that you don't ever invest inside of these smaller properties. If you have never done it before and you want to take a look at it, go for it, right? And I don't think it's a, there's a bad thing there. And depending on your specific tax, tax situation, it might, be, it might behoove you to do that. So you could certainly invest passively in some and then uh, also invest actively in some properties as well. That's actually as a, as a, as not a bad strategy at all. 
let's see. I think I have uh, one more question in here. Um, let's see. Hey, Dan, I uh, hope you're doing well. When you're talking to potential investors, how do you sell the value of investing passively in multifamily to existing business owners who are used to higher cash on cash returns in their chosen industry? For example, some of the hotel owners I know say that they're able to get 20 to 30% returns and would probably not be impressed by 7 to 9% in our space. Well, uh, I think you're going to have a hard time with that, um, to be honest with you. And the thing that you can sell them on is the diversification right? Uh, right now, if they're hotel owners, then they're hurting right now because travel, the travel industry has been just crushed and, pum and been crumbling ever since COVID-19 hit. And so now would actually be a great time to be able to talk to them about potentially investing unless they just lost too much money, right? Um, but I will tell you, I was a, I was a, I was a believer in investing my own, in my own business. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, back when I first got started in, in business, I had multiple people present me with various opportunities to invest. And I was like, no, 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 I'm going to invest in my own business because if I can snowball my investments into my own invest in my own business, then I'll eventually have more money than I, than I know what to do with as far as being able to invest it. And that's what I, that's where I'm at right now is that I can now invest in my money because my businesses are stable. They're cash flowing nicely. They do really well. And I'm not having to worry about, you know, putting more and more money back into those businesses. Now I still invest inside of my businesses. Don't get me wrong. But now we're making enough where I don't have to do that anymore. Um, and I want to just continue to maintain those businesses the way they are. I'm not kind of trying to kind of grow those at all right now. I have a good team of about 50 employees that manage that business for me and, uh, and run those very well. They're a good CEO in position. Um, but right now I'm focused on, on investing inside of the multifamily real estate space. And even though my investments are, are lower than what I could by just starting another business, Starting another business is like starting another, another job, right? And at this point in my life, I don't want to have another job. I want my money to start to work for me so I don't have to work as hard to be able to make my money uh, when it comes to starting a whole other business again. Let's see. For a passive investor, we get nice tax benefits on cash flow due to depreciation. Besides being taxed on capital gains rate, are there any other ways of reducing tax burden on the returns from sale? Is there a way to use suspended losses from depreciation? So the, what you're really referring to there, VJ, is, is and this is going to be the last question that I'm going to take because I do have to jump off here. Um, but it's the 1031 exchange, right? So the 1031 exchange, when you sell the asset, now some groups don't do this, don't offer this, but our group does try to do as best as we can to 1031 exchange into that next asset, right? So for those investors who are with us on a property, if we wanna go into the next one, we can. We're right now in the process of selling an asset and we have some investors in that property, they're gonna to wanna to move over and continue to defer their capital gains. So we'll 1031 exchange that into another asset. And they can continue to do that until they wanna pull their money out and or until they die. And when they die, the basis of that, their pro the property will reset to the, well, the current value of the property. Uh, their basis will when they die and it will defer those capital gains. Now, there are some things that, are, that might change based on presidents and you know, Congress and things like that, but I can't plan for that, right? You can, nobody can really plan for that kind of stuff. Um, people aren't just going to stop investing because of it. I think you'll probably see some reduction in, in investing because of that. That's one of the reasons why the, the tax code was built to begin with back in the early 1900s is so that they can get people who were just sitting on their money doing nothing to actually get them to invest in the economy and grow the economy. And that's why we have such a great economy as we do today. All right, so great questions there. Thank you everyone for being here. Let me refresh my screen here. Yes, we do. We have next week is a unique week. Um, so make sure that you think about some questions that you might wanna ask me because I'm going to uh, do what's called a AMA and ask me anything. Uh, and so that ask me anything is gonna be come with questions. So whatever questions you have, I want you to come with those. And I'm gonna type into the chat box here for those of you who are watching this live and you can go ahead and register for this next webinar next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. We're gonna be doing a AMA and ask me anything 
uh, where you'll be able to ask me any questions around multifamily, syndication, real estate, business, marketing, whatever it may be. And I will do my best to be able to answer those questions. And I may even have a guest or two that will be joining me. So we'll see what I can do there. Um, and some, Zach was just asking, will this video be posted? Yes, it will. So we'll post it to our YouTube channel, but we'll also send it out to those of you who registered so you can get access to the link here. So thank you each one of you for being here. Looking forward to seeing you back here next week.